Hello, I'm Dewan McCoy. Since September, I've owned Wish TV. I was born and raised right here in Indianapolis, went to Ben Davis High School and Butler University. As a local owner, I am concerned about the crime here in my city, particularly the murder rate. It bothers me, and I want to do what I can to advocate for change. I'm proud that my news team is taking the lead to this community not only to report on the problems, but seek solutions. I welcome our community leaders to Wish TV for the next 60 minutes, commercial free, to discuss ways to reduce violent crime and bring peace to the streets of the city I love. From Wish TV, this is a Crime Watch 8 special, City in Crisis. Senseless, that's what it is, just senseless. Killing for no reason at all. Right now on News 8, a city in crisis. Oh, she had a beautiful smile. She could have been the crazy kid. She was gorgeous. And that took her away from us. With the recent surge in violence. I mean, it's just killing after killing after killing. And it needs to stop. We are inviting city and community leaders to talk about the issues. We don't want to be known as a city that has a morgue that is overflowing. And discuss what can be done to inspire change. There's still purpose even in the midst of all this pain. That some other young person can see this and say, I want to do something different. I want to be better than my surroundings. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this important Crime Watch 8 special, A City in Crisis. I'm Brooke Martin. And I'm Phil Sanchez. Over the next hour, we will be talking with city leaders, law enforcement, and concerned community members about ways we could reduce violence across Indianapolis. Yeah, and we invite you to join the conversation. We'll be sharing your comments and questions from Facebook and Twitter throughout the evening, so please join in. Well, tonight we have invited leaders throughout the community to join us here in studio. Let's introduce you to them now. Uh, Charles Harrison, Reverend Charles Harrison is president of the Indianapolis 10 Point Coalition. Shonda Majors, Director of Community Violence Reduction for the City of Indianapolis. Randall Taylor, newly appointed IMPD Chief and a 30-year law enforcement veteran. Dr. Jeremy Carter is the Director of Criminal Justice and Public Safety at IUPUI. Rick Schneider is the President of the Fraternal Order of Police. And moving to the back, Tony Mason is the president and CEO of the Indianapolis Urban League. Donnie McKenzie is the president and CEO of Indiana Black Expo. And Josh Minkler is the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of Indiana, which includes Indianapolis. Sitting next to Josh is Melinda Coleman. Uh, she's a concerned community member. Reverend Rodney Francis is the Senior Director of Opportunity Youth Services at Employee Indy. And James Wilson is a concerned community member and the founder and chairman of Circle Up Indianapolis. All right. Thank you all so much for your time and for being here for this important conversation. Uh, we're going to get to that conversation in just a minute. But first, we want to start with this. As of today, police say 33 people have been murdered in 2020. At this time last year, it was 19. Yeah. Far too high. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about the numbers of violent crime here in this city. But re remember, each crime comes with a victim and a family and friends left to mourn. News H Jenny Dreisler reports. Crime scene tape and police lights. It's a scene Indianapolis has grown used to and grown weary of. When he hits close to home, it's unbelievable. I still can't believe it. Anything in this world I would give to get him back. But for some, it's more than a number. Just go home. You don't have to fight. You don't have to pull a gun. You don't have to do all that. You just have to go home. Let it go. And it's that aching pain. The city aches to stop. We have got to do something. What that is, I don't know. I don't have an answer. But I'm very happy to seek out the people who do. And I think there's a point where a community hits where it's, it's just time to take some action. And if you ask the community. My family has been losing members left and right. My 13 year old cousins died. My family lives with that. It's beyond anything everybody can possibly know. It's not a speech up here that we can deliver. Enough is enough. It stops with our children and all the killing that's so normal to us. It is not normal. It is not correct. So are we going to continue to talk? They've hit that point. A city that so deeply wants answers, but struggles to agree on how to find them. Trust. 
um, our community has experienced a lot of uh, broken promises. We've experienced a lot of people taking advantage of our pain. Over the years in the past, this has created a distrust. It's the same story night after night, scene after scene. As a community, not wait on the city and the mayor and the police department to do it, but we got to do our part, so let's start doing it now. A community paralyzed in fear, grasping for real answers to stop a problem that only seems to be getting worse. These are the people that are in the positions to take care of these issues. And we've been begging them to just speak out about it. And they've been silent. For people living in the city, what matters most are solutions. We know for a fact hurt people hurt people. These kind of uh, shootings and stuff, we like to say it's your drugs, it's this, it's that, but really it's conflicts. So where do we go from here? Where enough is now more than enough and has turned the Circle City into a city in crisis. So I would like to start at the very beginning, as they say, with a broad question that frankly may not have a definitive answer, but is worth asking. What is causing this surge in violence? Oftentimes when we see trends like this, we see a link. We see an economic downturn. Uh, we see retaliation, something of that sort. Chief Taylor, I, I'd like to start with you. What's the answer here? What's causing this? Well, you know, I wish I had a, a concrete answer on that. Uh, so many of the uh, most recent murders seem to be emotionally driven, uh, where uh, the the suspect in the case uh, is emotional over something and, and feels that the only outlet is to fire a weapon and end up killing. Uh, as was said in the story, uh, all of them are unnecessary. They're, they, they make no sense a lot of the time. Uh, so I, I've been around for a while. I understand the, the economic part, portion of it. I, I understand the uh, the inability for some to deal with those emotional issues. Um, but, you know, these things sometimes ebb and flow uh, with things. Last year, uh, we saw murders that went from, um, I won't give you a particular number, but we, we might be down two or three, and then the next day or next week, we're up five. Uh, you know, some of that was retaliation. Some of that we can point to to people that have a history of violent behavior, um, but not always. Well, what would you say the percentage is then of, of, of crimes that are conducted by someone with criminal behavior, criminal background? Well, it's probably a majority. Um, however, like I said recently, uh, a lot of it appears to be nothing but arguments over parking spaces or two friends that are arguing about something and end up shooting each other. Uh, people on social media who've done things, uh, all those things come into play. And that's a little harder to target, right, than, than those that we know are used to committing violence. Uh, that's a little easier road for us to go. We can kind of predict uh, with some kind of, a, of ability uh, that those people are going to be victims or suspects moving down the road. But uh, these ones lately uh, have not been like that. I want to open it up to the group. Any other answers? It sounds like Chief Taylor saying this is this is personal, this is conflict, this is domestic. Any other uh, answers for a cause in this surge, this specific surge that we're seeing now? I, I think I've been doing this for about 21 years now on the streets, and, and, and I do think you see uh, a large number of interpersonal conflicts now that is leading to violence, and, it, and it's somewhat different from what we were experiencing 20 years ago, where it may have been more gang and drug related where everybody today, you know, on the street just about has a gun. And now people are tending to settle their conflicts with violence. And, and it's not just people who know each other on the streets. We're seeing it more even with family members who are settling their conflicts with violence. So certainly that is a lot more concerning today and, and is unpredictable um, to really be able to target, you know, this kind of uh, violence that we're seeing that's more interpersonal. Dr. Carter, you study this stuff for a living. You're, you're a criminologist. Um, is that accurate? Has the, has the trend changed over the past 10, 15, 20 years? And also, is this something that's unique to Indianapolis? Uh, I, I completely agree with what the chief and the reverend said. Uh, if we look at what we know about the body of research on violence, we know that uh, individuals who struggle to deal with conflict uh, have trouble communicating, those, those things can be targeted with cognitive behavioral therapies that have been shown to reduce violence and reduce offending. Um, 
we know that that currently with the, uh, the, the mix of, of access to weapons, uh, the, the inability to, to solve conflict, the lack of perceptions that there are things worth, worth living for and these opportunities to have, uh, those things come together to create an environment that, that's difficult for, for juveniles to manage. And, and, and what was noted earlier about, about social media is it used to be these, these conflicts that individuals had were, were essentially on the streets and now you have where they're taken onto social media and it creates this, this mechanism where people feel like they almost have to defend themselves or defend what was said, where hundreds if not thousands of people may have seen what was said. Uh, and so it creates this additional pressure for youth to have to respond to. Before we move on, I, I want to touch on, on the, the issue of is, is this unique to Indianapolis? Do you see this happening around the country? This is certainly not unique to Indianapolis. Okay. okay. You know, let's go to social media. Sure. Um, I want to talk to you, Reverend Rodney Francis, too, and, and Melinda as well, because this is personal. We can talk statistics all day long, but when you are living it, when you are scared for your kids' lives, uh, it gets very personal very quickly. Talk to us about, and, and James as well, talk to us about what you are seeing in these neighborhoods. Is this social media driven what are you seeing well I, I would I would also also add that there's a, a large body of work out there that really talks about the influence of uh, of trauma and toxic stress on the brain development and how poverty is a huge contributor lack of opportunities to the underdevelopment of the brain and that brain function that is impacted the most happens to be our executive functions the functions that determine how we reason, how we think long term, how we uh, delay immediate gratification for long term uh, objectivity, the inability to cope with stressful situations. So we cannot dis divorce what we see in terms of the community of violence with the level of poverty and other um, st toxic stress environment in which our families tend to live. And so those things are huge. And so yeah, now you see a little small incident uh, like a, an exchange on social media uh, with a young person who may not have had the kind of support services to really be able to reason and think very well through the situation um, to do something that um, a person, a younger person who, uh, a, a, a something that you think a younger person might actually reason and come to the conclusion. So we cannot, I just think we cannot divorce in this conversation from the level of poverty and those issues and challenges that we see our families and young people growing up in. Yeah, Melinda, I love your perspective. You're a concerned citizen. Uh, you see this uh, firsthand. What are you seeing from, from the homes and from the streets and from the neighborhoods? Yes, um, well, uh, as on top of being a concerned citizen, I am also the founder of the Toady Foundation, which deals a lot with the homeless and the less fortunate living in poverty and also a federal trademark against the violence in a community actionist. So what I'm seeing is that uh, in our neighborhood, just on my way here, my ring went off. There were shootings at 1 p.m. There were shootings at 2.30. There were shootings at 3 o'clock. Mm -hmm. In our neighborhoods, where our children are getting off the bus and having to walk. So I feel that social media in, is a great influence but if we don't have or teach our children or give them any resources from pre-K to high school, which they may or may not be getting at home, whether they get it or not, we still as a community have to uh, jump in and say, this is a part of life in the world. We have to take and be accountable for our children as a whole unit to say, whether you need mental help or not, we're going to offer this anger management class in schools. And this starts when they are babies, when they are children. Because when you do not know how to conduct and direct your anger and you go off of emotions, then you have nothing but a spill of mess. And now is not the time for emotions. It's time for logic and it's time to, um, to do something bold and, and make an impact on what we're doing. Tanya, you've been a big part of this community for a long time. I, I saw you shaking your head there. Your thoughts on this? I mean, I agree with Rodney, and I agree with what was just said. I mean, when you have a toxic environment, for a lot of us that are youth-serving organizations where our goal is to work within the environment, 
right? And so for us, it's how do you love on our youth and how do you make sure that they understand that they are filled with purpose? And then how do you address it systematically because our schools are failing? Are, um, you know, we need alternatives to suspensions and expulsions so you're not creating a pipeline. And so all these things you have to address our justice system systematically while you're also looking at their environmental circumstances to, you know, just work with them directly. So absolutely, I agree with the rest of the panelists. It's how do we all come along together to make sure that we are strategic and how we all are addressing it. Yes. Okay. Uh, we're going to get to everyone. Um, we have Katira Winfrey, our multicultural reporter, uh, over here in studio. She is taking questions and comments mm -hmm. in live time from viewers who are watching. Katira, what is uh, the response so far? Well, Brooke, as you can imagine, the um, the response has been huge. Just like the people on the panel, they've been talking a lot about what they're seeing on social media and that same passion and that same push for concern is what we're seeing. We're going to take a look at Dan Frank. He says, I have lived on the east side since 2002. Tired of kids killing kids. How do I help stop the killing? Seems they have lost hope and any sense of the importance of life. How do we teach love and respect like Jesus love has, has to be an action. So that's just one of the things we've seen so far on social media, but different things like that have been just pouring in. You talk about the concern with young people battling it out through social media, and now we're talking about solutions. We're going to take a look at Carolyn Freeman. Being a retired teacher, the best solution to the problem is one word, parenting. They need to be present in their children's lives and know where they are 24-7. No amount of money or number of programs can replace this, but they can reach out to their churches, community centers, etc., for help to supervise their children. So this is coming from our public, the people who are seeing all this unfold, and just like you all, they're looking for answers. All right, Katira, thank you. I just want to get some reaction. We have a, a soundbite that we're going to go to from the mayor here in just a moment. But reaction to some of those those posts on, on social media? I mean, Anybody want to chime in? Shauna? Yeah, sure. Um, I agree that <clears throat> it takes all of us to um, attack this, this issue. And I think that a lot of the work that, that my team does is um, working with a lot of the community-based organizations in the community to work with our young people. But I want to agree with a lot of what the other, um, the Facebook person yeah. said about the parenting piece because we can, all of us up here can provide as many services and wrap around mm -hmm. to the kids as possible, but if we're not including the family as well so that that message continues when they get home, that's, that's going to be a problem. And, and it's going to give the kids a mixed signal. Mm. And so what we try to do through the programming that we work with is to engage the family as well so that if there are other services needed by the family that we can address those too. A lot of our partners are CWF or a Center for Working Families where they have that built in that they can wrap around the parents if they're looking for better jobs or if they need help finding childcare or whatever their situation is, transportation, to try to uh, remove those barriers so that we can get them involved in the programming as well. For residents who are saying, quite frankly, is it working? Is, is it working? Do we need more resources behind these programs? Um, when we get to the, to the heart of this and, and really talking about this surge, what is working, uh, Shauna? I think that we have to look at, because there, there are certain things that are working in, in certain pockets of our city and, and even across the nation. I think that we have to continue the work that we're doing. Um, this violence reduction initiative is brand new for our city. It's only been around for a year and a half. And so it's going to take a little time. We're not going to see the change overnight, but we have to look at culture. We have to look at poverty, as Mr. Uh, Reverend Francis said back there, creating um, environment where our kids can feel safe and be children again. And um, that love that the, the viewer talked about is, is critical from our, you know, our, our faith-based um, initiatives to our IMPD going out and, and reconnecting with the community. So it, it's going to take a retooling for all of us um, to get this right. And so we have to really depend on a lot of the community um, to come together and engage with us to do this because all of us up here, we can't do it by ourselves. It's not going to happen overnight. So we talked about some of the reasons behind the surge in crime. Now we want to shift the focus to what might be happening, what we can do to crack down on it. Your boss, the mayor, had some strong words about cracking down on crime not too long ago. Listen. 
Today, our message is simple and it is intentional. If you are in possession of an illegal gun in Indianapolis, we will find you, we will arrest you, we will prosecute you, and we will send you to federal prison. Again, strong words, and you saw behind him there, U.S. District Attorney Josh Minkler. Thank you for being here, sir. We appreciate your time. Um, you started an initiative in Evansville, and I want to get this right. It's called the Safe Neighborhoods Initiative. Uh, according to you, it's worked out pretty well, and you've also thought about bringing it here to Indianapolis. Number one, what is the initiative, how it works, and why do you think it would work here? Project Safe Neighborhoods uh, it has been implemented in Evansville, and it's been implemented here. It's been implemented around the country, and it's been successful in reducing violent crime. Uh, it deals with two things. The first thing it deals with is why are crimes committed, commonly referred to as root causes. We've talked a lot about that here. I've heard a lot about it. Um, Project Safe Neighborhoods, for instance, works with the mayor's office and Shauna Majors on Project Safe Neighborhoods community violence intervention, where we meet with people on felony probation here in Indianapolis that are tied to gun violence, and we work on providing them services services for drug addiction, employment, homelessness, we offer them those services right away. Uh, so it does try to deal with the root causes. But it also has to deal with who is committing the crimes, who is committing the murders. On that, the evidence, unfortunately, is very strong and it's very overwhelming. Eighty percent of the homicides over the last three years in Indianapolis have been committed with a gun. It's overwhelming. 70% of the suspects in those homicides have prior felony convictions. They are trigger pullers. And we have worked with the police department and with the mayor's office to add resources to the Crime Gun Intelligence Center. It targets trigger pullers, as the mayor mentioned, trigger pullers who are firing shots in our neighborhoods who shouldn't have a gun in the first place. One thing that uh, really surprised me is when I looked at the number of crime guns. The number of crime guns in Indianapolis, Indiana exceeds the number of crime guns in New York City. Uh, the number of crime guns in Indianapolis is 4,000. The number of crime guns for the whole state is only 8,000. Half the crime guns are here. So we have to target the guns that are being used to commit crimes. How do you target them, though? Uh, through the Crime Gun Intelligence Center. What we do is we collect shell casings, ballistics, any time a shot is fired, we collect that, uh, that's analyzed, we determine where that gun is and who's pulling the trigger. If that individual is a felon and is illegally owning a gun, if it's a drug dealer who illegally has a gun, they are targeted for the use of my federal resources. If there's an individual that's uh, selling drugs, that's a crime. Uh, we don't ignore that. But if there's an individual that's selling drugs with a gun that's pulling triggers, they're going to get some federal resources, if that makes sense to you. Sure. So, Tony, you've come out against this pretty vocally. Why is that? Well, at the Urban League, we definitely believe that interventions must happen. The, the violence and the crime needs to stop. But we also believe that there has to be something beyond punitive measures. And so our concern or worry becomes that in some other cities that this initiative has failed. And what we don't want to see repeated here in our city is stop and frisk, racial profiling, driving while black. Unfortunately, all too often, African American males, black males are the targets of these efforts. And we know that there are illegal handguns all over the community. And so what we don't want to see are just certain neighborhoods and certain zip codes targeted. And so our biggest concern is we want to know that, that there's going to be accountability in place and that this is going to be executed in a responsible manner that doesn't create the dynamic that, that we may very well be dealing with now. And this is the fallout from the 90s crime bill. A lot of the young adults and people that we're seeing that are struggling, dealing with poverty, multi-generational poverty, lack of access to opportunities. United Way data tells us that over 45% of our families are either dealing with poverty or they're living barely above the poverty line. And so what are we going to do to make sure that people get job training, access to jobs with livable wages? 
because again, that stress that many of us talked about earlier, that's real. I don't think there's a person sitting on this panel that would not go to the end of the earth to feed their, their spouses and their children. I just, yeah, I want to give Josh a chance to respond. On this issue, which Tony mentioned, we are in complete agreement. Uh, that's why we uh, in the Department of Justice have spent so many of our resources on why are these crimes being committed, the root causes, as I mentioned, the work with the mayor's office. But on the other hand, if there are individuals in our communities pulling triggers that shouldn't have a gun in the first place, there have to be real consequences for that. Well, hold, well, hold on, because Tony brought up stop and frisk, and it's something that's become, uh, unfortunately, a part of our political discussions here. Is that going to happen under this program? No, it's not. Uh, it, it's very, it's a strong commitment, uh, and I've, I've made this clear, that constitutional policing is the only way this works. If the people in the community do not trust the police department, crime will not go down. So it's very important that this be constitutional policing. Uh, as the United States Attorney, I do enforce the law. I also prosecute violations of civil rights laws. Uh, as Chief Taylor knows, as many of the panelists knows, if a police officer is violating the Constitution and infringing on somebody's rights, then it becomes incumbent on me from the Department of Justice to prosecute that police officer. So it's very important to me to ensure there is constitutional policing in this community and that the community trusts the police department. Seems like a hot button issue here. Who, who would like, James, you haven't spoken. <clears throat> I'm, I'm sitting here and I respect everybody's viewpoints and how they feel. I hear a lot of data, I hear a lot of statistics, I hear a lot of psychological aspects behind it. All of it equates, but I want to take something a little bit deeper. What I didn't hear is a historic legacy. Mm -hmm. Let's go back into the 1960s when Jim Crow was dismantled. You had an African-American community that was tight. It was very tight. We built and we worked together because we was going against the oppression. Moving forward, 70s, we felt a little bit of freedom after Jim Crow was over it, right? And so that level of disconnect for many, many years, and this is, this is a strong factor of the mental health component. That strong disconnect that was there for many years, it kind of trickled into the 80s and 90s. When we look at the 80s and 90s, we look at a lot of the individuals out here committing those crimes. It's a strong disconnect because everybody's going to jail. There's no opportunity to really advance. There's no emotional peace that's behind it. Uh, it's understanding the culture of our community to the fullest. And understanding the culture of our community to the fullest is no more conversations. You have to get down to the root. We all know poverty is equated there. That's, that's a common factor. But going, going back once again to the 80s, when poverty took hold in the black community across the nation, not just Indianapolis, you see the numbers astronomically high. Look at Miami. The cartel was going there killing everybody. People had to eat. People need to survive. We don't wake up every morning with a gun in our hand trying to kill somebody. It goes back to what Tony just stated. When survival kicks in, you're going to do what you feel you have to do. Do. And so that conflict that we're having in our community because we don't know how to communicate anymore because it's about survival. Mm -hmm. When it's about survival, we got to get it. There's no ifs, ands, buts about it. So with that being said, if we really look at our culture, redesigning our culture in the black community, there's a million and one programs. I work with so many across the city, and they're phenomenal. But the reality is when I deal with the recipients of those programs, bro, I still got to feed my kids and my daughter. Mm -hmm. It gets real, and yeah. they come and holler at me, and so we try to open up other channels. There's, we need to look at it on the state level, too. I hear a lot of local government right here, a lot. Mm -hmm. But let's be honest, local government can only do so much. The dollars just allocated out, all the money we keep asking for in the community, comes on the state side. So this is interesting because, James, you brought up communication, and it's not only communication within community groups, it's, it's communication here on the stage. Uh, Rick Snyder with FOP, uh, you, you've been a, a vocal critic about a lack of communication with this particular issue with gun violence. Um, what are your thoughts listening to this? Well, you know, you go back at least over five months ago where uh, Reverend Harrison and myself stood on a corner in downtown Indianapolis following a mass shooting, asking where's the outrage. Um, we were asking that because what we were asking that of was our community leaders, our elected, civic, appointed, and business leaders. Uh, not of our residents, not of our officers. We're all outraged. We've been outraged for a long time now because we're the ones that are caught in the middle of this violence. Uh, you know, I point out, we don't have any elected leaders on this panel here tonight. Now, maybe that was by design, but 
to the point that was just made. It's going to take the actions of governments and elected leaders to reconfigure the resources to get at the heart of this issue. The one thing that has not been discussed that we keep contending from our perspective as law enforcement officers are there are steps that could be taken within the criminal justice system that plug some of the holes and close the revolving door of criminal justice. Here's why. You just heard it from our U.S. attorney. The vast majority of these gun crime murders are being conducted by people with, that have prior criminal history repeat offenders. We are seeing it at the local level. Proof positive is we have the mayor that said, if you commit a gun crime, we're not only going to pursue you locally, but we're going to pursue you federally. Why? Because inherently in that statement, we know that there is a lower lack of accountability at the local level, a greater level of accountability at the federal level. The point is this. We are seeing repeat offenders, violent offenders is who we are talking about, not low-level, not first-time offenders, who are getting cycled back out into our neighborhoods and then are re-offending and victimizing our community. What we have said is take the murders, take the non-fatal shootings, the stabbings and other aggravated assaults, create a database where we can start to track the criminal conviction histories, not only of the suspects when we identify them, but also the victims. People say, why do that? Because what folks will see is what our officers know. When we show up on the scene and we run the criminal conviction histories of those people involved, we see that oftentimes one or both of those parties should not, could not have been there had they been held accountable for prior bad acts. What that tells us is it's preventable. Chief Taylor, you want to respond? Yeah. So uh, I agree. I, I've seen the statistics. I've uh, I've spoken with Rick, uh, uh, and I know that uh, uh, a lot of the people we are dealing with have do have histories. Um, uh, what I'm really hoping to see is that those whose histories are are not as great, that we're able to get some kind of help, get them on the right path before they go down a path that they can't get off of. Um, uh, total agreement that those who are, are committing these violent acts needs to need to be put away, uh, and they and they need extended time. Um, and I don't think much of the community disagrees with that either. I, I think the concern is, uh, can we help those who maybe haven't got quite to that level yet? Can we do anything for them so that their lives aren't lost moving down the road? And that's what we're looking for. Reverend Harrison, I want to turn the conversation to you because you started one of the most well-known programs uh, across uh, all of Indianapolis. Um, over the years, it seems like you've had some infighting when it comes to dealing with government and other programs similar to yours. Uh, is that the case? And if you can expand upon that a little bit and maybe help us out here a little. Well, I, I think the, the, the challenge is, you know, when we look at what has happened in Indianapolis, particularly from, from 2000 to 2012, we saw a lot of success uh, when many cities across the country were really struggling with the violence issue. We averaged about 95 murders uh, a year, and, and we saw great collaboration between law enforcement, grassroots organization, churches, and community stakeholders. Um, who were able to really address the multifacets of the violence. It, there, there's no one silver bullet. You know, this is so complex, and it goes back for decades when we start talking about, you know, the violence that we're seeing in Indianapolis and across the country. Um, and, and, and part of the challenge has been, how do we continue to do the kind of initiatives that have been successful in the past in helping to curb this problem? And, and that's where some of the the, the conflict has been, you know, in the city. When, when we look at for almost 13 years, you know, we saw a lot of success in reducing the violence. It's just been in the last four or five years we've really seen a surge where other cities across the country are, are seeing a decline, where a few are seeing a upsurge, an uptick in violence. So th that's been part of the tension in the city, yeah. you know, from, from what was successful in the past, do we continue to do that? To, to what is being done now. So, so you know, you have to move beyond that and, and do your part. Shauna, we'll get to you in just a second. Reverend Francis, you've been raising yeah. your hand. So, uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so a lot of conversations have been around uh, jobs, uh, economic opportunities for families. I appreciate the uh, caller who asked about the parenting piece. You know, um, we're, at Employee Indy, we're pretty clear that we do believe that many of our hard-working families are stuck in survival jobs 
And we have been working hard, working with our community-based organizations and with uh, our employer partners to create some better job and career opportunity jobs to lift our families out of poverty. Parents are working three or four jobs, so they can't be home. They can't be there to pass on the kind of values that they want. They would love to, but they need three or four jobs now just to make ends meet. And so we're, we're saying that we, we want to be able to make sure that our families and the community are, is able to offer those uh, better jobs, those career jobs that will allow families to be able to be at the PTA meetings with their kids and to um, help pass on this and pre prevent some of this violence. We also believe that a good job can stop some of this violence. Uh, my friend here mentioned that many of these young people who are out there carrying weapons, well, it's hard to ask them to put down a tool that's associated with their economic viability without asking, without handing them something that will replace that. Mm -hmm. So we want to replace that weapon with, with, a, 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 uh, co with a contractor's trial. We want to replace that weapon uh, uh, with, with an opportunity with a welder's tool to make some, some genuine money that they can really take care of their families. So what does that take? More resources? Like, w how do we do that? It takes uh, uh, op absolutely opportunities. We need employers who are willing to come along and give these young people an opportunity, second chance opportunities. Many of them are willing to commit themselves to the training programs that we have available if they knew that there was a viable opportunity for them on the other end. Someone, uh, the chief mentioned prevention. Let's, let's do some prevention and prevent some of these young people. Mm -hmm. Well, we have re-engagement centers around the community where we are trying to do just that with the help of the mayor's office and the city. We are creating these spaces for young people to come in and show them some career paths where we can get them launched onto some positive careers rather than seeing and seeing what's happening and available to them in the streets. Melinda, you're shaking your head and you raised your hand a couple of times. Um, I want to take it a little deeper. I appreciate everyone on the panel and all that you have to offer um, with what the mayor said and with respect to the mayor, Rick, and everyone on the panel, our U.S. Um, My attorney. Their attorney? Yeah. Okay. So, um, from, from me, um, speaking as a, a dark woman, I don't say black woman, but as a dark woman, and with children, my children are 30, 23, 14, and 8, okay? so. If I want to change my community, now my household, I know the control is there because I'm the parent, I am there, my husband and I are there to teach our children. But there's things I have to teach my children that you don't have to teach your children, okay? And then so I'm putting them in a systematic system to tell them how to act in front of a police officer and authority mm -hmm. and try to keep them out of the streets, out of gangs and such. And the mayor says that, you know, you have the illegal guns, we're coming forward. Okay, we have to rise as a, a as a community to say, yes, there was a time in our lives where our parents would stay, what happens at home stays at home. Don't call the police mm -hmm. on nobody black because they're going to be dead. Mm -hmm. So these are things we grew up with, okay? But now that we want a serious, huge change, then not only do we have those gangs and those people with illegal weapons accountable, we also have to have our police officers accountable. We have to have those prosecuted. We have to show our community that this officer is doing wrong and not to award them and have them keep jobs or get on suspicion with pay. Once you show a community that this right hand is lifting off of this left hand, the communities will come together and say, hey, this is not happening in our community. And John did this and Bob did this. We have to unify in a great way. It's no small talk with the resources and I commend everyone from what they're doing. But this is not a, a small situation. Yeah. This, these are parents. Right. There's grandparents raising children. That's right. So that generation lost gap. Their grandparents in their home scared of their own grandchildren mm -hmm. because they know of the. It's hurtful to see your neighbors and your children in your own family. I had a family member kill his own son to save his life, else his son would give him. So. When we start at what we can do at home, is fine. But as a community, as a city, and as a state, we must show everyone we're doing some on every level. Because all these billions that our children are going to jail and all this money, our city, we need to put those resources back to say we are, I'm not playing with um, 
you, I'm gonna use you. I'm not playing with you if I know you belong to a hate group. You can't be on my team to serve my city. So we need actions from the ones that I'm not able to do it. Right, and this, and this trickles down, and we're talking a lot about um, we needing the community to come forward, to help the police department. Um, and, and part of that, you touched on that issue. There is a culture of fear that, like, that, that is keeping um, uh, us from doing that. So what, what is the answer there? So, yeah, Rick. Well, that's one of the things that we talk about, right, is that you have to have trust and respect. And one of the things that we keep identifying is that it's the residents and the officers who have the most in common. They have the most invested in the neighborhoods because they're there 24 hours hours a day. But a lot of times we get a wedge driven in between those two groups and get them pointing fingers at one another rather than seeing they actually have the most in common and the most at stake. And so one of the significant contributors to that is this fear, this fear of retribution if I cooperate with the police. Well again we ask the question where does that fear come from? Well, when you talk to folks, what they say is, I would love to tell you what happened here, but I know that the person you're going to arrest will be right back out, and I fear that. And so, again, we've got to close the door on the revolving door of repeat violent offenders, those who are known. But in our city, we talked about gangs, criminal gang activity. It's an automatic $500 cash bond, and we cycle you right back out, even when you have prior convictions. That's the point where we've got to make those, those, those changes flip those switches in the system to help interrupt the cycle of violence. Is there enough being done when it comes to witness protection though, Rick? Um, because I'm sure that's a concern too for many of the, the folks that you talk to out on the street. The greatest thing we can do for witness protection is keep the alleged offenders behind bars, especially when they are known repeat violent offenders. That's the best thing we can do to protect them. Second to that is, I think there have been great steps that have been taken related to a witness protection program, but I think inherent in that is it keeps getting back to this, this issue, right, of retribution, fear, retaliation. Uh, Reverend and, and others, we see it all the time, do we not? A murder happened on the east side, then a murder happened on the west side, and, and back and forth. And inherent in that, we start to see that it's retaliatory kind of crimes. The question becomes, here and now, not six months from now, tonight, how do you interrupt that cycle of violence? It's through intervention. This is serious. James, I'm, I want to get to you after this because uh, our, our medical reporter, Dr. Mary Gillis, recently sat down with Dr. Virginia Kane, uh, Marion County's um, health director, and she called this a public health crisis. Strong words. Let's listen to her. It's difficult for people to understand why gun violence is a public health issue. Can you speak to why? It's really a public health issue because public health looks at populations as a whole. And so when you look at the enormous amount of homicides across this country, the number of folks uh, that are killed and the families that are impacted, why not be in a public health uh, issue? Because it impacts all different factors or divisions related to entire communities. We don't want our young children experiencing violence in their neighborhoods or seeing a homicide or hearing about it. It's almost like post-traumatic stress disorder for our young children. So, but we have a lot of work we have to do in Indianapolis, and it's no one um, department, no one individual uh, responsible for this. This is every resident in Indianapolis. Until all of us get on board, we're not going to address this issue. James, you were raising your hand. There's two things that I want to touch on, and um, Rick, I'll get to your point in just a minute that you just made, but one thing in particular, in your original question that you asked Reverend Harrison, as you know, we see conflict amongst each other ourselves. We didn't talk about that up here right now, and as it should be stated. You have a lot of organizations, especially grassroots, that are highly connected to the community, and you have some major organizations that put in a lot of work in and respect the work that they do, but they don't have no connection. I work directly with everyone you can think of and there's no direction and no connection to the community. How can you continue to advocate for something you don't understand? Let's start there. The next thing that we want to talk on, Rick, to your point, you know you and I have been going round and round for the last few weeks in regards to this whole issue. You can't put, and Chief, you know I love you to death, but you can't put white officers in black communities and say that they care. Because I've been pulled over a couple of different times, they don't have a clue. I never tell them who I am, who I connect to, and what I do. And the connection that they have, they automatically stereotype. And this is just within last year. 
they automatically stereotype. They come in aggressive. Do you really think in the black community that we want to connect and want to help somebody like that? We ain't got nothing to talk about, none whatsoever, because when you come to us, you come to us already with a preconceived notion what you're going to run into. I watch, I know the Alpha and Beta commands that the officer use in the community, and I've seen it. And I have nothing against officers. I have great friends as officers, but we have to be real about what's out there and what we're facing. Social media shows it all. You had an officer in another state that threw a gun, uh, excuse me, threw a taser on somebody and shot and killed him. He was recently convicted. You think it's things like that don't happen here? I'm not saying that any of our officers will, not by any means, but when you approach and interact with us and you expect us to kind of be like, hey, Mr. Friendly Officer, it's not going to happen because the reality is, at the end of the day, you come with a negative tone, you're going to get a negative reply. Mm -hmm. Chief Taylor. So I, I totally understand where James is coming from. Uh, however, uh, the help and support that needs to happen is from that community. I've often said that uh, we have to go into individual communities and ask for their solutions because what may be a solution mm -hmm. and a conversation with someone at 42nd and Post may be totally different from a different east side or west side neighborhood. Right. Right. Uh, we have to engage those citizens there, get their ideas, and then help them come along. But it's not all going to be from the police department standpoint. It's going to have to be from within that community. And uh, I, I think James is right. There, a lot of times there isn't much direction, and that's got to stop. I, I think that's where our problem is. I think people have got a lot of great ideas, uh, a lot of experience, and those kind of things, but we're missing that action step to make it happen. And that's going to require the whole community to come together and start making that happen. And we'll have to put aside some differences, whether it's uh, an issue you have with the police or an issue the police have with you or, or whatever. Uh, we're going to have to get past that if this is going to change. Do you have enough officers to make that happen? We can always use more officers. Uh, uh, we're below where we want to be right now. We're probably about uh, 50 or 60 off, but uh, we've got a new, new class coming in. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, former Chief Roach had put into to play was uh, beat policing, extending those beats. I think we're about at 78 right now. We're hoping to get to about 106 which will allow officers to have more connections with the community. Hopefully they're not the ones that James is talking about that don't care, right. but actually uh, will care and show uh, empathy in that community and, and feed off that and, and understand what those real issues are and do what they can to, to implement change. Do Dr. Carter, do you, you study, again, you study this stuff, do, you, does, do the studies show and the research shows that the more officers you have on the streets, beat policing and such, help uh, fighting crime? Short answer, yes. Uh, everything that's been said on this panel is completely true. Uh, if, if you look at the decades of evidence we have from other cities, including here in Indianapolis in the 1990s, about how do you reduce violence, um, it, it's all of these things, but there has to be more focus. We know that in any urban city, the vast majority of gun violence occurs in a very small proportion of places. We know that within those places, the vast majority of people are very nice and safe. The problem is that you have a very small minority of people who are problematic and, and, and engage in crime in those places. So how do you target those places with a fine balance of punishment but resources and incentives? As it was talked about back here, you can't ask someone to turn in their gun and not give them something else, right, if their yeah. livelihood depends on it. So how do you have an infrastructure that can go in to these places and, and, and target trigger pullers but, but target people who are problematic that are truly problematic and then punish those people but at the same time provide resources and opportunities for people who are actually seeking those opportunities. Uh, and, and so what you do is, is known as you take these additional officers, you focus on, on these specific places and offenders and you go in uh, with punishment but then you have to backfill with appropriate, with appropriate resources. Um, and so that is essentially the effort to cool places with enforcement, but it has to be balanced. And, and it's completely true on here. A big part of this is, is legitimacy and procedural justice. You can't have officers that go in and, and are completely aggressive. It has to have uh, individuals who interact, whether it's, it's, it's white, black, brown, purple, pink, it doesn't matter. How do you treat me and how do I perceive that I'm being treated? Uh, and and do, you, do I think that I'm getting a fair shake? Tanya, I want to get to you, too. We haven't heard from you in a while about this public uh, health crisis. But, Shauna, you've been raising your hand, so I'll just give you a chance to respond here. Sure. I, I just wanted to add and, and 
professor took it, but a uh, balanced approach is what we have to have in our city. And that means that, you know, we have to get ego set aside. We have to come out of our silos and we have to really work together strategically, pointedly and focus. And that means from Mr. Mason and his group all the way around to Reverend Harrison, uh, we have to the things that we did back in the 90s for a lot of the crime prevention back then was different because we actually had gangs that we could point to and call members, leaders in from those gangs and say, look, you need cool. to chill your people yeah. out. Mm -hmm. But now, because our culture is so different and things are so fluid, there are no such things as gangs anymore. They're, they're cliques, they're cartels is what they call themselves. And so because it's so fluid, it's, it's difficult to pull off a true group violence intervention in the city because that, that that's not there anymore. So we have had, as leaders, and a lot of us work together up here, have had to tweak what that looks like to fit the new world, so to speak. And so a lot of our kids are, are very much into social media and threats and all this stuff. And so we have to change our approach and come up to speed to what they're doing to be effective. Tony, you were raising your hand and Tanya as well. Take it away. Absolutely. I think one of the key things that I think we're all touching on here is trust and the need to develop trust between law enforcement and communities, but also between our respective organizations. It's tough to ask the community to come forward when we know that there have been instances where individuals who have come forward have been exposed in the process and then subjected to retaliation. We also know that, and I'll take our agency, for example, with our workforce development initiatives, we're seeing sometimes 200, 300 clients per month. And we know that they're coming from every neighborhood conceivable in this city. But could we be working better with James's organization or someone else? Absolutely. And so I think hopefully this discussion is maybe the beginning of a new day for all of us collectively. And I think that's how we have to, we have to look at this. Tanya? And I would just um, sort of add to the comment that was made um, earlier from the professor with respect to the balanced approach. We have to talk about the needed investments in the community just as much as we talk about enforcement and what we're doing on the punishment side. And I think um, just making sure that not only those economic opportunities are there when we talk about the jobs and making sure that it is a livable wage, um, but also going back to the educational system and again, the, the systems um, are broke and how do we fix that and so you have the cultural issue you have you know the relationship policing community relationship there it's multifaceted um, but for us I think that this is a good start because everyone needs to be in the room and at the table as we are constructing that plan because other otherwise we continue to operate in our silos and so you know I may think that Indiana Black Expo is doing a great job with the programs that we have Tony may think that the Urban League is doing a great job, but that's silo impact. And so if we want to move the needle, it has to be collective impact. And so the way that we have to pr approach this is it has to be more strategic with everyone at the table. Absolutely correct. I mean, uh, after 26 years doing this, I'm absolutely convinced in, in looking at cities that have worked is that law enforcement alone 100% will not work. If you just enforce the laws, it won't work you have to address the root causes of crime. But I'm also absolutely concerned and know that if you just address the root causes of crime and ignore enforcing the laws, if there are no consequences for violating the law, that won't work either. So it does have to be a balanced approach. What, Josh, to piggyback on that, from our perspective from the community, we understand that law enforcement has a job to do by all means, and I get that. Tanya and to Tony, you're absolutely right. We have to come out of our silos. In my neighborhood, along in Martin Del Brightwood, I'm fighting internally with uh, organizations, which is bad because in return, this is the reciprocation. The community don't get what they need. So coming to the table and we build those relationships, I may not like how Shauna view things and so on and so forth, but if I take the moment to really listen, Shauna makes some good points on something. Let me implement that. Um, so I'm very huge. Those who have been following me for years you know I'm very big on building partnerships. We cannot 
do this alone. Did anybody know how tired it gets at night when I'm up? I'm getting phone calls in the middle of the night. I'm ripping and running, dealing with families and so on and so forth, coming out of my dollars. I don't get grant dollars with Circle Up. I put my own money into Circle Up for many, many, many years. I get up every morning, go do a job, come home, pay my bills, and go hard. I get the crisis they're going through. With that being said, by us working together, we build more resources back in the community. We build the grassroots organizations once again. you got to have the pulse of the people, and the grassroots organizations have that pulse. <coughs> if, you, if you disseminate that, they can go get in the people here for sure, right? right? And so build those relationships. You get uh, <coughs> reactive information directly from the community. You see things start to develop and grow. I'm not, I don't consider myself a community leader at all. A lot of people say, oh, James, you're a community leader. I'm me. That's who I am. And me is part of the city of Indianapolis. I'm not better than anybody, and we must move forward thinking that way. Well, you wouldn't be up here if you weren't a community leader. So just <laughs> take that for what it is. Well, Brother James said, uh, we do have to hear from the young people. Um, at Employee Indy, one of the things that we have done was we've launched a series of courtside chats at our re-engagement center that's really used basketball as a hook to pull them in, sure. but we're also using them to have conversations about violence prevention, and we launched it yesterday for a series of conversations. 27 of them chose to come in a room to have that conversation, so we're really excited about the possibility of what will come about as that. That's a great transition because to conclude our time together, and it sounds like something really uh, hopeful is being birthed here in this room. I, I want to end with a rapid fire question for each of you to answer. Uh, what do you need personally or your community or is a bigger whole? What do you need in the next month, the next few months uh, to, to really make an impact and find a solution here? Go down the line. Reverend. Uh, volunteers, more volunteers to, to care about the kids and, and get involved. Shauna. Community involvement. Mm -hmm. I'm going to echo that community involvement with the emphasis on making sure that we're having those action steps and that we're not disjointed, that we're all moving collectively forward. I thought for sure you were going to say more officers. <laughs> well, that, that, that's an always. <clears throat> uh, data and partnerships. I would say the judicial system to do their job to close the revolving door so that we can stop the bleed and then focus on the root causes related to this violence. Yes. We need the business community to really engage on this. The bottom line is minimum wage has to be increased to $15 per hour. Brookings Institute data told us a year and a half ago that minimum wage should actually be $18 per hour in order to help families move towards self-sufficiency. And until we address that, we're still going to have these daily issues in our community. Tanya. A strategic and collaborative plan that shows how all of us coming together and how each part plays a role where we move, move the needle. And so we move away from the silo impact to collective impact. Sorry, Unequivocal support by the community for constitutional law enforcement. Melinda. Each of us got to dare to care. Each of us got to reach each other. And we have to come together and be strong together, but unity is going to be the key with bold actions. Reverend. Many of the families we serve are working in survival jobs, and they can't turn or lose that job to go after training for a better career job because they need that fund. We need employer partners who are willing to come alongside employee to build out career pathways that will also not just a promise of a job, but the guarantee of a job and support while they're going through that training to get that job. Mm. James. I need some food because everybody keeps telling me I'm too little. I need it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, the reality with Circle Up working on, we're working on a unique housing initiative and in the healthcare piece, especially uh, focused on children with chronic illness and disabilities. So those who have those experiences, uh, please come to the table and I'm more than willing to work and partner and build it out. We have about two minutes left. Uh, are conversations like this helpful? Yeah. Coming together, bringing everyone in the same room, leaving the politics at the door, and having an open discussion about this. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. And, and what were some takeaways that you received maybe from somebody else that you thought, hey, we need to move on that, we need to expand on that? Anyone that had have takeaways? Once again, from a grassroots organization, thank you, Tanya and Tony, for willing to be open your door, and Shauna and Chief to continue to push and understand that the initiative starts with the people and they're willing to build a partnership. So I'm willing to partner with everybody. Great. Shana. I was just going to say that I think we have more in common than what we think and that we need to build on that commonality and roll our sleeves up and get this work done. Mm -hmm. Chief Taylor. I would say uh, the only thing that's missing right here is the community, obviously. So as we have these meetings, they've got to be part of it in order to make this happen. Yep. Great.
Urgency yeah. is the matter at hand. Urgency, Urgency is, the is the matter, matter at, at hand. hand. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, you look at the numbers, right? We're, we're uh, 36 homicides, 33 murders. We had a 74% increase in murders over this time last year. Uh, you know, if we truly love our fellow neighbor, uh, and care about them. Urgency is the matter at hand because the statistics are telling us somebody will more than likely be another victim of violence tonight. And uh, we have to move on this. Dr. Carter. I, I, would, I would echo what, what Shauna said. I think what you've heard here is that a lot of people are in agreement. Uh, I think there needs to be uh, a linchpin. I love the idea about a strategic plan that gets everyone on the same page because I hear of there's so much going on in the city, but there appears to be not a lot of focus on who's doing what, uh, what's it achieving, but also uh, someone asked what works. Um, we, need, we need good data collection to figure out is it working? What's promising? What should we spend our dollars on and what should we not? Important stuff, and I think that yeah. this is just the beginning. Thank you all for being here. Really important conversation. Maybe there's a round two in the future. We're not That's be able all to our time. In one conversation, yeah. unfortunately. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Have a good night.